from a manager perspective, I do think you have to have your own, you know, your, you do have to have some standards, some things that, you know, are lines that you're not willing to cross. If you're not willing to tell the council what has happened in terms of a gift you've gotten or a lunch that you've accepted from somebody or whatever, then maybe it's something you ought not to do. are listening to Manager Brothers Lessons Learned. Twice each month, Greg and Jay Goodjo draw on their combined 80 plus years of state and local government work experience to help listeners avoid the pitfalls they and others have unwittingly stumbled into. And now, on to the episode. Welcome to another episode of Manager Brothers Lessons Learned. This is Greg Goodshow. And this is Jay Goodshow. Uh, Jay, I am really happy to talk to you this time of year. We're coming into, well, we're in the midst of the holiday season here. And I don't know what your experience has been, but one thing I noted from uh, noticed from my years of working in local government is that vendors became really generous this time of year and started dropping off freebies at the office. Did you see the same thing? We saw a little bit of that, yes. Well, I think it's maybe because I was around longer, and I think that that has maybe gotten scaled back in more recent years. Um, But one of the things that I would commonly see right up to the end of my time as a manager uh, was that we would start getting, right around this time of year, we're going to start getting the boxes of candy and the the cookies coming in the office and those kinds of things. Uh, right. You know, yeah, I mean, that's that seemed to be commonplace. Now, what was your practice when those things kind of landed on your desk? Well, you, you know, they, uh, I guess the assumption was is that anything that was brought into the office was uh, community property, I guess you want to say. It wasn't, it wasn't targeting me specifically as a manager or an elected official or anything like that. So, mm-hmm. uh, and, and most of the time it was, you know, those, those kinds of things, whether it's candies or, you know, popcorn seems to be a, a popular thing or various, you know, various flavors yep. of popcorn yep. and, and, and whatnot. So, you know, those just got left basically out, you know, if the public came in and wanted to help themselves, they could help themselves or or we sent some over to the uh, Department of Public Works, you know, so there were other employees uh, right. had that. And there was nothing, there were no strings attached to accepting those kinds of items. Um, mm-hmm. I think our, our policies were more when it came to something more tangible, uh, you know, money-wise or or um service wise i guess that that we you know that was how we we would address those kinds of things yeah yeah and and, and I th- for the most part that's exactly the way that i you know that i handled it it didn't matter whether the vendor brought it and handed it directly to me or maybe handed it to somebody else in the office uh, what i saw was those things never went home with with people they always ended up typically would have like a break area or you know an area in the back office where uh, the word got out pretty quickly and so you know if, if, if uh, like toward the end of my time I'm up on second floor uh, it didn't make any difference there you know, people right found their way up there once they learned that there was caramel corn available or you know or whatever it might be now there was one exception uh, to that uh, in uh, and this uh, was a couple of communities ago we had a meat processor who managed manufactured sausage uh, and at Christmas time and this went on I think every year that I was there there was a box of assorted sausages that made their way to my desk and that was understood it had been going on before I got there and that was kind of understood that that was for the manager and of course that's not the sort of thing you can leave laying out in the you know in the break room that's uh, true you know and so what I did the first year I think that that happened uh, you know it came as a surprise to me and uh, so what I did was I took it over to the Salvation Army and donated it to them but after that what I did was to uh, put all of the names of the employees in a hat 
uh, and left mine out of it so that I never had any opportunity to draw. But then we draw a name out and notify the employee that they had a box of sausage that had been donated, and you know, and that that was theirs. I thought that was the you know I thought that was the you know, the best way to go about handling how you know how that should be uh, managed i always was pretty uncomfortable with that um, that whole kind of thing uh, having something that was intended specifically for my benefit and there was one other one that i had and i can't remember which community this happened in it happened several years in a row i think it was if i remember right it was way early in my career we had a company that uh, you know one of the vendors one of the firms that we did business with and at this time of year, they'd send a catalog, and they expected that you were going to go through the catalog and identify a jacket or a sweater or a sweatshirt or some other kind of item. And I think these items had value in the $50 range or greater, even at that time, uh, all those years ago. And you were, they, the expectation was that you were going to, you know, you were going to get a uh, you know, your name on the list for getting that kind of an item. Uh, I never took advantage of that. I don't know if you ever, you know, I don't know if you ever saw anything that that went along those kinds of lines. No, the the closest thing to that were uh, companies that, um, you know, we might be. Uh, what it wasn't our specific municipality, but because we belonged to a regional uh, sanitary uh, sewer. You know, waste treatment mm -hmm. uh, system, uh, or the company that that uh, was involved in in uh, running running the plant. Uh, you know, once or twice a year, we'd have some kind of a group meeting for all of the municipalities that right. that uh, tied into that system, and they might provide uh, hats with their logo on it or whatever. You know, for yeah. everybody that was there, and that was that was kind of a not considered the same kind of a freebie, I guess you might say, even though it was in fact a freebie, but there was right. no intent that they were going to get any benefit, you know, from distributing hats. Right. So, yeah. What about, what about lunches for, with vendors? Uh, boy, I don't remember. Particularly engineering firms. Do you, do you have that situation? Do, do, yeah, I haven't. I don't think I, I don't recall uh, ever having experienced that. I guess so. really that yeah. was, and again, some of these things I think have changed over the years. But that was fairly commonplace uh, at, at various times in my career, where uh, particularly I think engineers would have these people. A lot of, there's a lot of engineering firms out there. They want to make sure that their name is in front of the, you know, in, in front of managers who are thinking about projects. And so you'd get a call from one of these representatives, and they'd say, "Hey, you know, I'm going to be in town." Uh, at 11:30 on such and such a date, uh, if you got time for lunch, and that, yeah. was a, that was a pretty common. That was has always been a pretty common, uh, pretty common practice, I think. And then I, I will say that I took advantage of that. I, I didn't. Uh, I felt that it was one of those things where no one would expect that for the value of a hamburger that I'm going to sway a contract. Um, that was just a part of the way they did things. It was expected that you know you're going to take clients potential clients out to lunch and you have a conversation with them over lunch that sort of thing yeah we you know i, I can think of instances where especially after we had like a uh, some kind of a storm or whatever and you know the department of public works was working uh, a lot of hours to help clean up you know debris from it or whatever and somebody had a lot of uh, tree limbs down or whatever they might send some pizzas over to the dpw garage for you know lunch for the employees just as a, a word of thanks i guess right uh, you know that's not the same thing i mean they didn't expect anything else in return they were just you know real thankful that our dpw uh, was on the job and and doing such a, a good job for something that they might not have been able to handle by themselves without the village you know being able to step sure. in so sure yeah um one of the other ones that, uh, again, was very early in my career. I had just started in a new municipality. It was a couple of years into my career, and I'd gotten a call from the movie theater right across from the street from City Hall. And they said, um, we need to have your address so we can send you your movie passes. <laughs> and I said, what are you talking about? And they said, well, we always have provided free movie passes for the city manager. That's something we've always done. Uh -huh. And I said, well, you're not doing it to me. 
And they said, well, your predecessor always took them. And I said, well, I'm not taking them, so I'm not going to give you my address. <laughs> I said, I will be more than happy to attend the theater from time to time. Uh, and I did, um, but uh, but I am more than happy to pay as well. <laughs> but that was, you know, that was uh, something that had been a started at some point in time where and you know and again I don't know what their expectation was or they were just trying to um you know, show some kind of consideration for a public servant, uh, but that's one that I always, and still to this day, uh, even though, you know, of course, the value of a movie ticket back in those days was not very high, <laughs> but uh, unlike today, that's a significant value to those uh, when you go to the theater, but right. um, but it, you know, it, it always seemed uh, like something I never wanted to, you know, I never wanted to get involved in at all. Yeah, we. The, uh, one of the things that I can think of, this actually occurred when I was an elected official uh, before becoming a, a municipal manager. Um, I was uh, act, out to went to lunch with the, uh, the admi village administrator to a restaurant in in the community. We had you know very few restaurants to choose from, so anyway, was, you know, we always tried to do business in in town, and uh, this one particular. Uh, restaurant was uh, owned by a couple that uh, came from a what was a former Eastern European bloc uh, communist country um, mm -hmm. anyway and went in there with the manager a couple of times and and you know we've order our lunch and and eat and get ready to leave and the waitress doesn't bring us you know a, a a bill mm -hmm. and we said something and she said that we we're not charging you and this, you know, this happened twice that I can think of. And we were, and I think the first time what we did was we left the money on the table anyway. And right. whether she took it as a, you know, whether the waitress took it as a tip or whatever, we, we didn't concern ourselves with it. Well, I think the second time um, we, uh, as we were getting ready to leave, we had words with the uh, owner and said, you must charge us for our lunch. And, mm -hmm. she, and he said, we couldn't. We couldn't in the country we came from because uh, you would cease to exist. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> that was part of the part of the uh, uh, the way things went with with police and government officials sure. uh, in in that you know that era and that in that country. We said, well, things are different here in the United States, and uh, if you uh, continue to not charge us for our lunches, we we will have to stop coming in here altogether. So that put an end to it, it reluctantly on his part I think but sure. that put an end to it but it was just I just said you know we can't we can't risk having somebody see that we're coming in here whenever we want to for a you know a free meal right. um, you know it just it's just not appropriate even if you don't expect or get anything in return you just it just can't be allowed right Right. So. I, I have a I have a very similar story, and I, it's going to take a while to kind of go through the the setup for that. But I do want to talk about that because it, it, there is a, a little slant on that that I, I want I want your opinion about this as we go through. But uh, I, I as it relates to that, you know, the point that you were making, uh, the ICMA guidelines on accepting gifts provides states uh, members should not accept any gift that could undermine the public uh, undermine public confidence and i think that's exactly the point that you were making about this now they yes. say de minimis gifts uh, the guidelines say de minimis gifts may be accepted in circumstances that support the execution of the member's official duties or serve a legitimate public purpose. Um, and I've always, you know, I don't know whether these guidelines have been uh, updated to clarify uh, what is meant uh, by accepting de minimis gifts. You know, de minimis, obviously, low dollar amount. And they go on to suggest right. that, you know, a manager ought to establish kind of what that is. So maybe it's going to be 20 bucks if it's a lunch. Uh, you can do. But the problem I run into here as I try to apply that to circumstances I've been involved in is, 
How does my going out and accepting lunch from a an engine, you know, representative of an engineering firm, uh, support the execution of my, you know, my official duties or serve a legitimate public purpose? I'm not, I'm not sure, and, uh, yeah. and it's kind of interesting because I have known managers who have taken the position that they are not going to uh, go. You know, they're more than happy to go out to lunch with a representative from an engineering firm, but they're going to buy their own lunch, and right. I think that that's maybe, uh, you know, as I think back on it and look at the application of these guidelines, I think that may well be a, a better standard uh, to, uh, to em- employ in a situation like that. Well, and then, you know, I guess depending on how far you want to extrapolate this, you know, conversation, if you have an engineering firm that is uh, a sponsor for an event at a conference, for instance, you know, they, they sponsor an after hours, you know, uh, get together, something mm-hmm. like that. How, how how does ICMA or any other organization view those kinds of gifts, so to speak, that right. don't benefit a particular individual or even a particular uh, municipality, but the profession as a whole? Uh, you know, how how do we view that then, or how should we view that? Yeah. And, that's, and that may be a question you can't answer, but I'm just throwing that out. We need to think about those things. So. Yeah, and I think I think you know to some extent, in, in I think a little some of that may relate to who's invited to participate in this. Um, and we had an engineering firm that we and many municipalities did business with, uh, and one of the things that they would do is after the annual legislative conference put on by the municipal league, they would host a dinner and they would invite all of the council members and uh, city managers from municipalities in the entire county where they were doing business. And so that was one that, you know, they just routinely did. It was an opportunity, obviously, for them to talk to the elected officials about the services that their company provides, and but they also provided a, a forum within which the, you know, the council members could talk to people from other municipalities and, and those kinds of things. And, of course, the council members are not bound by the same guidelines that the managers are bound by. That's right. one that, you know, I never felt bad about participating in that. Uh, in that dinner because, uh, you know, I'm just tagging along with the council members and uh, making sure that, you know, if any of them needed bail money, I was there. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you joke. You don't know some of the council members I've had. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, and I guess that kind of brings up the whole, you know, when your uh, idea of if you're bidding out a service, you know, for let's let's we we're gonna we can continue to use engineering firms sure. and we bid you know, you you put out this RFP or an RFQ and you bid out a service and you get, you know, at least three firms that respond, let's say. Yeah. Many, many municipalities have it built right in that um, what the what the conditions are for uh, but pass, bypassing the lowest bid, for instance, right. you know, and, and after you've, you know, if everything else is equal, um, you can say, okay, we're going to give preference to the local engineering firm if they're within ten percent or something of yep. of the lowest of the lowest bid. You know, th- I guess that's a whole other conversation too. You know, right. whether those kinds of things should happen. Um, you know, and that's and that's where when you have these soirees, I guess that an engineering firm or another firm might be putting on, does that tip the balance in their favor by the fact that they've done that in the past? Yeah, and I that's again that's that's a tough one to know. I think that from a manager perspective, clearly the guidelines are clear. You cannot allow those kinds of offers to influence a recommendation that you might make to the city council. And if you do, I think those are things that you know can easily come back and haunt you when that happens. Yep. We'll return to Manager Brothers Lessons Learned in a moment. Do you have a topic you would like Greg and Jay to explore? Are you interested in being a guest on Lessons Learned? Do you have comments about this episode? You can write Greg and Jay using the contact form at gregllc.com slash lessons. That's G-R-E-G-G-L-L-C dot com slash lessons.
I want to I want to return to the idea of you know the, or the example you offered of not being charged for lunch by uh, somebody. And so yeah. this is this, again this is a little bit longer story, uh, and I'll try to keep it as succinct as possible. We had a uh, uh, owner of a Mexican restaurant who uh, relocated from the building that he was in to a brand new building that he owned. He'd been leasing a building, went into an owned building. Uh, but where he had been previously located, he did not have, uh, he didn't own the liquor license that was owned by the owner of the building. And so he operated under the liquor license that he didn't own. He goes into a new building, his own building, he no longer has a liquor license. And so uh, I and my community development director were having a number of conversations with him over the years because he wanted to have a liquor license and those are not the easiest things to come by and he was talking about what might we be able to do for him and so we had a number of conversations about that. We had a number of conversations about uh, some zoning. I think he needed a, a variance for something that he was doing on the site. And so, uh, you know, he would be in my office, uh, you know, a few times and we'd have these conversations. And I remember around one occasion in particular, I said, you know, when you get, get it get in there and and uh, when you finally get your liquor license uh, I was curious whether he carried Don Julio 1942 tequila and I don't know if you're a big tequila fan but the no. about the best tequila that you can buy is Don Julio 1942 it is a sipping tequila it is not one you would waste by putting it into a margarita by any means this is yep. Yep. Uh, and I had had it before it's expensive tequila and he said Absolutely, we will have that. Uh, we will have that tequila. Well, eventually he did get a, a, a liquor license. They managed to get a resort license. I was astounded that they could uh, could get one, but they got one. I got a resort license and opened up, and a while had gone by, and I hadn't been in the the, the new place. And uh, my you know Sue, uh, my wife was uh, her birthday had come around. Her brother uh, and his wife were up visiting us at that time, and so I said, "We'll have Mexican and and uh, uh, food," and and so we did. We walked in there, and because it's the first time I was in there, I asked our waiter to go and let the owner know that I was there. And so he came to our table and I introduced him to the, you know, to the other members of the, of the, the group that was there. And so we had a very nice dinner. Uh, and at the end of the dinner, uh, I said, well, now we need to have some Don Julio 1942. And so several of us were going to have, uh, have shots of the, of the tequila and the uh, waiter brought over a um, it was still in the box and it came in kind of a nice presentation box and it's a, a you know a fairly long neck bottle that this uh, tequila comes in and he opens it up and you know uh, makes a, <laughs> a show of pouring it into these little glasses and then he proceeds to you know put the cork back in and and uh, um, starts to put it back in the in the box and I said you know that seems odd to me why wouldn't he just put that on the shelf you know I, I figured that you know we were the first ones to ever order Don Julio 1942 in this uh, restaurant uh, yeah. but you know wouldn't you just you know now that you've got it out of the box wouldn't you put it uh, well what he does is he hands it to me hands me the box and oh. indicates that's a gift from the owner oh boy yeah well that's <laughs> the value of that bottle was uh, I think at the time 110 or 120 dollars or something like that so not an inexpensive bottle and I'm really feeling very uncomfortable. And, of course, I say, I can't do that, and, and you need to send the owner over. And he refuses to even go get the owner for me to talk to. <laughs> you know, he's, uh, he's, he has gotten his instructions. Oh, yeah. We are going to get that bottle of, of tequila. And then it came time for us to get the bill for the dinner, and there's no bill for the dinner either. So I figure we've got a value of $200 or something like that, retail value, $200, uh, that is being comped to us by the owner of, uh, of this restaurant. So let me ask you, in that circumstance, Jay, what would you do? <laughs> Other than be squirming in my seat. <laughs> I mean, well, and clearly yeah. none of us have $200 in cash on us. It's yeah. not like you can, you know, get a dig into your well, I never carry that kind of money, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I learned not to carry money when I had teenagers. <laughs> yeah. So, wow. But so what would you do? Well, I mean, typically I would you know, want to speak to the owner. 
Yeah, well, if, you, if, that's not an option. He's hiding yeah. in the back someplace. Uh, I'm not going to go ran, uh, try to run back into the kitchen to see if I can find him. Yeah, I, boy, I... <laughs> I'm not sure what I would do. I guess you're no you're no help at all. I would go. I guess I would. <laughs> if, if you wanted to leave cash or something, you'd have to go to an ATM or something and yeah. and, and withdraw the cash and come back yeah. um, and and leave that. But uh, um, yeah, I don't know. Here um, here here was my concern, and let me let me see how you feel about this. My concern was that. You know, again, my contacts with him you know, were not that many, and going forward, you know, I wasn't going to have that many occasions. It's not like he's trying to influence me. At most, he's trying to thank me. Um, but my concern was, and and I should indicate that the owner of the restaurant grew up in the agave, one of the agave regions of Mexico. He was very familiar with, um, you know, the making, the harvesting of agave and the making of tequila and those kinds of things. And I think had come to the United States when, you know, when he was an adult. Um, but in any case, uh, one of the concerns that I had about this situation and the reason that after my initial protestations, I didn't pursue it any further, was I wasn't sure what his cultural um, background would have been what the culture was that he came from and how my protesting and trying to pay for something that he had and attended as a gift, how that would be received. Um, and so I was, I, I really was very hesitant and I, and I just don't know. I still to this day don't know how, um, you know, how a Mexican, is that an expectation of Mexicans that in a situation like that, they give a gift. And if you refuse the gift, that's, you know, that is a tremendous level of insult. That was the concern that I had. And like I say, I don't know to this day how that would be viewed, but I was very concerned about being sensitive to, you know, to that culture. Yeah, I mean, this is similar to the example I gave, I think, but certainly right. you're talking about a lot, you know, a lot larger dollar amount, and 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 basically we resolved it, um, right, for for the next time we came to the restaurant. So yeah, and uh, I t and I told him the same thing when I had a chance to see him. I said the next time I have to pay. Um, yeah. You know, and so I had seen him again going in there for lunch. It was, you know, it was a place that I would go to lunch once in a while. And so, you know, I did end up paying you know, in sub for subsequent meals. It's not like every meal I ate there uh, I got for free, and I've been back a number of times since then and have always paid the bill. Um, and never got an, I never was offered another bottle of Don Julio in 1942. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, but, all right. So, so, all right. So then what do you do? Yeah. You, you know, here here is the issue that I the concern that I had uh, was it's that's a, it's questionable from an ethics standpoint. So I the minute I got back to the office, I immediately sent all of my council members an email describing the situation, describing the thought process and let them know exactly what had happened. Um, yep. So that there was, I was trying to be as open and above board about that, um, so that there would not be the, or would lessen the potential that if the word got out, that it would influence the public perception of me or of the government. So right, right. No, I think that's probably the best that you could hope for is just right. to you know communicate that to your elected officials. Yeah, so, many of yeah. whom later said they wished they'd been with me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's ever offered them a bottle in a Don Julio 1942. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and again, that's a, it's it's one of those gray areas there where it's clearly not de minimis. You know, this is a gift right. that is a but it's a thank you gift. It's not a gift that was intended as a way to influence anything that I would be doing in my capacity. And that was certainly you'd have to know the individual to know that just not in his character. That's he had no interest in doing that. This was clearly a thank you uh, from him uh, for the little bit of, you know, I mean, I didn't do anything more than say, we'll do everything we can here and help a little bit with the you know with the uh, how we uh, handled the request for a uh, zoning variance but you know not enough to it wasn't enough to you know my role and that was not enough to warrant uh, getting a you know a $200 freebie uh, from him by any means but yeah. uh, I think that that's it's one of those areas where sometimes there are gray areas uh, it, but uh, you have 
from a manager perspective, I do think you have to have your own, you know, your you do have to have some standards, some things that, you know, are lines that you're not willing to cross. Uh, but then also to be as frank and, and open about things. If you're not willing to tell the council what has happened in terms of a gift you've gotten or a lunch that you've accepted from somebody or whatever, then maybe it's something you ought not to do. So, Jay, do you have a sponsor for today's episode? In fact, I do have, uh, Greg. This uh, episode of Lessons Learned was sponsored by Neuropath Clear, which is a, a new nutritional supplement. And I'm sure you've heard about the supplements that purport to improve one's memory. Mm-hmm. Uh, but this one actually gets at the root cause of the problem. Um, as you may know, the human brain only has a trillion or so uh, neural connections. So uh, unlike our computers, which you can uh, clear memory space by mm-hmm. just deleting all Old, old data, the brain doesn't have that uh, delete function, doesn't have a delete button that I know of anyway, uh, until now. So <laughs> Neuropath Clear effectively suppresses duplicate information to make room for more current information. So mm. while I might recall you know, numerous iterations of a contract I wrote 30 years ago when I worked for state government, I might forget my anniversary. <laughs> So what Neuropath Clear does is deletes those duplicate copies from my memory. Mm -hmm. It improves my current memory capacity along with improving the relationship with my wife. Whoa. So there you have it. Wow. And has this this been approved by the Food and Drug Administration? Well, just like all of the other supplements that are out there that uh, don't require uh, uh, approval by the Food and Drug Administration, this one is considered a nutritional supplement, so it doesn't uh, it doesn't need their approval. Uh, well, okay, so uh, buyer beware. Well, what's coming up next? Well, what I would like to uh, have us. Uh, delve into is uh, something that will interest, I think, uh, every manager out there, uh, not just Michigan, but others outside of Michigan as well. And I would uh, I would title this uh, uh, as to be or not to be a manager. Uh, so using borrowing a little bit of a line from uh, Shakespeare's Hamlet, uh, mm-hmm. this is going to delve into um, manager contracts. And this will be uh, an initial conversation uh, looking at what might be in uh, manager contracts or what should be in manager contracts. And I recognize this is a huge topic. Uh, this uh, I, I, I make no uh, pretenses that this is going to, you know, we're going to cover everything in a in a thirty minute uh, episode. This is probably going to be the first segment of several uh, episodes, not necessarily consecutive, but uh, periodically we'll come back to this topic and and pick up another uh, element of of this. I think it'd be uh, something that would be really useful uh, for uh, municipal managers everywhere. Good, good. I look forward to that conversation. I might, I might learn something for my next contract. <laughs> you might at that. <laughs> Actually, I don't think I have to worry about that, but nevertheless. <laughs> and neither do you. That was I point. haven't either, so. <laughs> no, nobody is begging me to come back and work full time. You know, uh, they were more than happy to have me around for a few months as interim, but then uh, get the heck out. So <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> so. All right. Well, let's wrap it up then. listening today. We hope you enjoyed the show. Manager Brothers Lessons Learned is a production of Greg Guidance LLC, a multi-specialty consulting firm offering interim management, group process facilitation, workflow analysis, operational studies, and more to local governments in Michigan and